chapter 8 in uh, Bioethics is Love of Life. Um, and it's going to uh, go hold universality of bioethics in love. At the end of this book, uh, we're left with a question. Is love of life the bioethics that all people have? I challenge anyone to find another source of reasoning or emotion that's stronger than love. Um, while we cannot scientifically prove that love is real, love shapes our life and is a foundation to our personal and social development. It would be a naive person to claim that human beings are not molded to a significant degree by the love acting in their life. In the exception, which is to kill people, people usually kill to defend something they love, their land, their families, or their view of life. The power of love is great, shaping many actions, and in the end, it has been shown to have the power to overcome hate and discrimination. As seen in the lives of the Crusaders like Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. in the 20th century. Love is a common people's definition of ethics. And I think it should refocus our attention on where we should be looking to develop bioethics. In this book, I've reviewed a range of literature and historical studies and the reasoning people have in surveys and interviews. Classic literature such as Frankenstein or Moby Dick, built on a long tradition of questioning science and technology and on our development, but is now symbolized in the bioethics endeavor. People have been using ideas of bioethics uh, over history, especially in religions. Bioethics is part of this behavior, ethics that relates to biological questions and to all human relationships. It is time for improvement though. As King in 1967 said, humanity is waiting for something other than blind imitation of the past. We must be hammers, shaping a new society rather than advils molded by the old. This will not only make us new men, but will give us a new kind of power. It will be power infused of love and justice that will change dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows and lift us from the fatigue of despair into the buoyancy of hope. The major criticism of the use of love as a guiding principle of ethics is that it's not concrete and leaves problems in deciding standards of value and defining situations. However, some of this concern is resolved if we consider love as an intelligent process of acting for the good of people, respecting persons and avoiding harm. There is room for prima facie principles to help decide cases, but these can be expressed in the language of love, and this may be the way that people do actually make decisions. Section 1. Uh, what goals are universal? Uh, this is, a, by the way, uh, the picture on the start of chapter one. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows this picture or knows the pun that I'm playing, but this actually is a picture from Universal Studios in Hollywood, one of their sets. Um, I have argued that all people have bioethics of behavior, and we share many of the points used in the process of reasoning, although the decisions may differ. The first objection to this view that love is universally appreciated is that it is apparent to anyone who looks at the problems of the world that the ethical principles people are using are not working very well. This does not mean that the ethical guidelines that are used by particular groups of people will not succeed in developing a better world. But it does mean that none has been able to be applied universally all the time. And it makes us question and ask whether love is a descriptive principle of bioethics. Even as we approach the 21st century with renewed hope for a new phase of international relations following the collapse of the Soviet superpower and the demise of a Cold War mentality that persisted for nearly half a century, the last century, half of the 20th century. The reality of daily wars and conflicts uh, still continuing don't allow us to, to forget that the world is made up of groups which claim to be different. The claim to be different from another group, often made by leaders of a particular social group or gang, which underlies many conflicts, 
does not mean that such groups are actually different, only that it's claimed that there is a difference. Conversely, another popular belief is that we are seeing the emergence of a one-world culture from developments in communication, transportation, and trade. This links people together so that they wear the same clothes, for example, blue jeans. They eat the same kinds of foods, for example, hamburger culture and fast food chains. They read the same kind of newspapers or view the news on the internet or cable television networks. Newspaper media outlets may be controlled by the same few people around the world. There is also a trend for political groups to become larger and more integrated, as seen in the development of regional blocs. The European Union being the most integrated, making people predict the formation of a single world government more integrated than the United Nations of today. However, power struggles tend to split these large groups apart as well. Trade is being controlled more by multinational companies, which requires the presence of international law and ethics to police, because their power is stronger than many governments. The extent of diversity or similarity in universal ethics can be scientifically measured, and it's important to gather further data on these questions. As surveys and observations have shown, and as discussed in Chapter 5, people in different countries do share uh, the same thinking and reasoning. Basically, that data suggests that the diversity of thinking within any one group is much greater than that between any two. Therefore, basic universal F principles may be useful in deciding these F issues. The social environment that people grow up in and the education strategies are becoming more similar with time, suggesting that a universal approach is even more possible now than it was a century ago. There is a universal diversity of views, and such data is a challenge to all of us to incorporate or explain into any description of the real world. Only when we accept others uh, are the same as us is there actually a hope to stop the ethnic and religious wars that have plagued the world and still do. We can also ask whether universal ethics is even desirable. Different societies have different goals as do different people. This diversity is to be valued, and the type of universal ethics that I have discussed in this book is one that will maintain diversity. If our capacity for diversity was lost, it would not succeed. Hum diversity is part of what we call being human. It is what could be called an integrated cross-cultural approach to ethics. We should never expect all people to balance the same values in the same way all the time. But the mistake that most make is to think that the people in, all in one group are the same. All groups are diverse, and we can never presume that our neighbors will reason the same way as ourselves. Love and respect for others demands that we should also give traditional societies a chance to adapt themselves to the modern life, rather than just merging them into the global modern order. The next page has a figure uh, 8.1. Uh, actually, this is the world's tallest Buddha. It's in Ushiku in Japan. It's hollow with memorials as a cemetery inside it. Energy allows us to improve the quality of life and progress our society. And so uh, this picture of the old and the new uh, next to each other is, uh, I think, uh, interesting. Um, I used to take people here when I lived in Tsukuba. My home is, uh, this is between the airport, Narita Airport, and my home. Uh, this is the great uh, big Buddha. Uh, so it's the world, world's tallest Buddha. Uh, inside, though, um, is a very interesting to see the, uh, um, the graves. If we pursue a global unity, we should still recognize cultural plurality. We could define cultural plurality as social and political interactions within the same society of people with different ways of living and thinking. If we accept uh, plurality, we reject bigotry, bias, and racism in favor of respect for the traditions of all in society. But this ideal is seldom met. In many countries, 
there is usually some form of ethnocentrism which prevents plurality. Therefore, universalism, in a, the sense that everyone thinks the same uh, way and balances ideals of action the same way, is not possible. Nevertheless, there are benefits of basically similar values of a good society as shaped by all people and societies. Harmony and tolerance are two values. All would agree that tolerance of cultural diversity is generally welcome. The limits to tolerance are already broadly outlined in international covenants such as the Declaration of Human Rights and international treaties against abuses of human rights. Um, one of the practical issues for global uh, and social justice is whether groups with little p power are oppressed, in which cases the international community may attempt to restore order. There are also international treaties on environmental protection outlying some of the limits of damage to the common environment that will be tolerated by other countries, such as the Convention on Ozone Damaging Chemicals and Deep Sea Dumping. We also have economic treaties such as GATT, defining the limits of unfair trade. However, as was discussed in the previous chapter, uh, usually economic priorities conflict with environmental protection and we need better uh, resolution of this conflict in practical bioethics. One of the common goals shared by many people is to make a world with more harmony. If we look around, we can only see limited examples of harmony, but we cannot even dream of making a perfect world. That is God's realm. There will always be some people who do not seek harmony. One of the principal failings of many ethical systems is that they ignore the selfishness of human behavior. Human beings often disregard ethical norms and standards and will continue to do so. Apathy continues to be a common response, uh, but there are many efforts to develop bioethics. Uh, apathy means we don't really care, and many in the world don't seem to really care about finding the future uh, together, only about their individual uh, economic well-being. So does this mean that it's pointless to try to develop universal ethics with a goal of a more harmonious world? I think not at all. In fact, we have uh, common goals to preserve a planet. We must be realistic, recognizing our spiritual, social, and biological limitations. As Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, but he did not say that we could expect human society to be at peace in its current self-seeking state. Some economic and social systems have been successful in limited circumstances, but they have all had problems. This is uh, no criticism of desirability for um, a universal ethics. Neither is it a reason not to try to achieve a universal uh, harmony. Um, the social and economic inequalities of the world have been a feature since recorded history, but they've also been misused by selfish pe persons. The systems of economics often have more impact on the policy decisions than the ethical and religious norms that people follow. Wars may be fought over religious differences, but often they are based on poverty. In an even more crowded world, we can expect more unless inequalities are lessened and nationalism and racism are squashed. The environmental crisis has added its cry to that of human suffering. And as it becomes recognized that uncontrolled consumerism is not sustainable on the planet, we need to look for fresh and integrated approach to ethics. We also need to shift the philosophy of many human activities, including science, to pursuit of love in the broad sense. Francis Bacon made love of knowledge the great human and social value. Under Baconian philosophy, the long-term aim of inquiry is to contribute to human progress. But the immediate aim of inquiry is to produce objective knowledge, together with explanations and understanding of what it means. The search for truth is considered to be of intrinsic uh, human value when pursued for its own stake, or of pragmatic or technological value when pursued as a means to realization of a non-academic uh, human social ends. The idea that the philosophy of science should be based on the pursuit of wisdom rather than the pursuit of knowledge has also been put forward by various um, authors.
and a number of governments. Um, the pursuit of knowledge would say that the proper aim for rational inquiry is to achieve, acquire knowledge about the world. While there may be secondary uses of this knowledge, the first priority is to achieve the uh, uh, purely intellectual aim of obj acquiring objective knowledge of truth. The claim is that we must disassociate itself from the goals and values of common social lives so that the claims to objective knowledge can be subjected to rational assessment. Uh, this is probably inconsistent with bioethical decision making, which would normally apply uh, the pursuit of knowledge to pursuit of wisdom, of uh, things to make the lives better or to improve the ethics of the world. Proponents of a philosophy of knowledge may acknowledge the importance of moral and social problems associated with science, but seldom do they call into doubt the integrity of science itself, the definitions of knowledge, or their philosophy. As a human being can be concerned, um, they can be concerned. But as a scientist, their task is to concern themselves uh, exclusively with problems of fact, truth, and knowledge. Instead of priority being given to the tasks of articulating problems of life, with problems of technology being secondary, it is the reverse. A philosophy of wisdom is that it may avert further human disasters that have come about as science has been used. If we can develop socially influential traditions of inquiry and education devoted to the promotion of a cooperative, rational problem solving in life. People may claim that science is ethically neutral. This implies that scientists do not have responsibility for the production of knowledge. However, this belief confuses the findings of science, which are ethically neutral, with the activity of science, which is not. Some pursue the neutrality argument by claiming that the moral burden lies with those who choose to implement knowledge for all purposes. We, we, we may not be able to predict the abuses of pure knowledge, however, uh, scientists are still moral agents and must think in advance of possible abuses of science uh, that they, their research leads to. Scientists favor, may not be solely responsible, but they share responsibility with all of us. All human activity needs to be subject to ethical discretion, and if love of life is the under underlying ideal, then the activity should be guided by this. Technology has been the most powerful agent of change in the recent past. Therefore, we can clearly see the need for universal ethical maturity and understanding. There is a popular belief that there is a conflict between science and religion, but the questions that they discuss are different. Uh, as Karl Popper, uh, a famous philosopher of science, said in the falsifiability hypothesis. A scientific theory and a question is one which can be disproved. Only a theory for which we may can design an experiment to disprove it is actually scientific. Many questions are not of this nature, especially those which involve life or love. So we can only suggest answers, as I do here, to confirm that our bioethic is the love of life. As Martin Luther King in 1963 wrote, Science investigates, religion interprets. Science gives man knowledge, which is power. Uh, religion gives man wisdom, which is control. Science deals mainly with facts. Religion deals mainly with values. The two are not rivals. Although we should try to apply wisdom and reason to develop bioethics, bioethics involves these questions of value. Even more dominant it is the pursuit of economic growth, often seemingly for its own sake. Countries try to increase their economies by a certain percentage every year, regardless of the environmental and social consequences. There is only a limited correlation between economic growth in percentage terms and increased living standards. Other measures such as personal wealth and ease of living are economically desired. Um, the goals of societies and the measures that reflect the life goals of society need to be examined more. There must be an end to consumer demand and increased economies, 
or is this the only goal that people of the world have for themselves? So we can uh, question that. Um, the, that's the end of a section one and two. Uh, and thank you for sending the picture of Karl Popper, Hassan. Um, he was a, a famous uh, philosopher of science. And uh, you can read some of his work, but the falsifiability hypothesis is one of the most uh, important aspects. I uh, listened to his lecture once in uh, in Cambridge uh, when I was there, and uh, he was still active in his 80s, uh, but a very active um, philosopher. And so this is, uh, uh, in a sense, one of the uh, sort of introduction. We're going to go on to um, the next... Uh, section, section 1.2. So uh, we have here a picture of an ant hill uh, with ants uh, living in different parts. Uh, it's a home for ants. So the title of the section Global Ethics starts at home. When we realize that the enormity of many of the bioethical problems we may want to give up, yet uh, we must realize that individual action is a necessary prerequisite for developing a better world. Uh, 8.21, love of neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Individual shortcomings can destroy the harmony and peace of any relationship, but collectively they can have global consequences. The basic principle of ethics still is love thy neighbor as thyself. And this is what's followed uh, if this was followed, then there's no need to write a book on ethics because everyone would be ethical. Uh, and we don't need to restate that bioethics is love of life. According to Confucius in the book uh, Analix, written in the 6th century BC, the experience of love begins in the home amongst one's closest blood relatives. The instruction to honor one's mother and father is included as one of the Ten Commandments. Mencius believed but human nature has an innate predisposition to favor one's family, which was several millennia earlier than the selfish gene idea of evolution, which supports this view as well. As uh, Lee Arcocca wrote in Talking Straight in 1988, no matter what you've done for yourself or for humanity, if you can't look back on having given love and attention to your own family, what have you really accomplished? The family and community we call home is at least a testing ground of love. Um, in the figure 8.2, uh, it has a picture of uh, paper-eating cows in India. So you see the cows going through the rubbish and uh, eating the paper. Um, okay, there's a picture from uh, uh, actually Silcha in uh, uh, Silcha is in. Um, the north of Japan, uh, north of India, sorry. Uh, there is another picture, the second one is a dumping of rubbish on the side of us, waiting for the rubbish person to collect it. Um, there's another one on dumping of rubbish in Japan. Uh, unfortunately, some of these people missed the rubbish bin and uh, they put rubbish around the, uh, the park. And here is a, finally there's a picture of vending machines, which are a common addition to nature in Japan. So you're in the middle of a green nature, and here you have a vending machine to uh, stop and get some drinks. Now, if you're thirsty, this is very convenient. Uh, the electricity coming to the vending machine, you see the pole uh, behind it. It provides electricity from the electrical supply lines, which, which do run everywhere. Um, but is this, uh, is this aesthetically beautiful? Maybe not. And is this, in fact, uh, is this a problem of uh, uh, aesthetics and litter? So going back to the text, there are large and small problems of it in ethics. Uh, we can think of problems that involve the whole world and problems which involve a single person. 
We can think of global problems such as the depletion of the ozone layer, which is increasing UV radiation affecting all living organisms. The problem can be solved by individual action to stop using ozone depleting chemicals if alternatives are available to consumers. The law should encourage us to think about our ethical duties and attempts to promote justice to all, recognizing our failings and selfishness. Our selfishness is simply excessive autonomy. The International Convention to Stop the Production of Many Ozone Depleting Chemicals is one of the best examples yet of applying universal environmental ethics. Another environmental problem is greenhouse warming, which results mainly from energy use. This problem, however, can only be solved by individual action to reduce energy use. We could do this by turning off lights, turning down heaters and air conditioners, building more energy efficient buildings, shutting doors and driving over light foot. These are simple actions that everyone must do if we're concerned about our planet, like being tidy with litter and recycling. Yet not many do. Energy consumption could be reduced 50 to 80 percent by lifestyle changes with current technology if people wanted to. After the Fukushima nuclear accident in Japan, many reactions were taken off, reactors were taken offline for maintenance and routine checks. And through the summer of 2011, businessmen took off their jackets and ties as an example of lifestyle change. They could then increase the air conditioning temperature and reduce energy consumption significantly because uh, they took off 45 nuclear power stations from the energy grid, uh, which meant uh, uh, reducing 30 to 40 percent of the energy consumption. The first uh, restarting of some of these nuclear power stations has uh, recently occurred uh, last year, um, as they've meant to implement new safety measures. But uh, by reducing electricity consumption from air conditioning, less energy is used. New technology for energy production, such as solar power or, or wind power, may help, but lifestyle change can have much more immediate effect. The economic interests of major electricity and oil companies slow down uh, some of the uh, substantial reductions in energy use by reducing the goals that people strive to attain. The picture that's painted in this book is realistic optimism and the practical conclusion of such universal ethics must be in the synthesis of all the traditions, ideals and aspects of biological, social and spiritual heritage that we have. But we includes not only peoples of the world but all of life. However, ethics relates to how we regulate human behavior and so this book is written in those terms. Ethics does start at home and with each one of us we cannot wait for someone else to tell us how to love or what laws should govern our action. While we can learn from the examples of saints and many who uh, love more than we, we cannot leave solutions to others. The joint responsibility of all world citizens is to love others and do the best we can, knowing that we are imperfect beings. Um, so we cannot leave it to governments to look after the planet. The actions of individual members are what we need. Some types of environmental improvement can be brought about by individuals. And maybe some of you have done such actions. Some useful guides have been produced on how each person can save the environment. Using alternative products is one option. In many countries, improving the efficiency of lighting in houses and street lighting can result in very large reductions, 50 to 75 percent in energy consumption. Not only do the consumers save electricity charges, eventually uh, light emitting diodes will mean lights may also be cheaper over an extended life cycle. There also should be a change in behavior that uses excess resources, such as a reduction in the use of unnecessary lighting. Another example is how we can reduce human health damage caused by increased UV radiation. The quality of sunscreen lotions, the clothes that we wear, and changes in people's behavior are needed. Uh, what we can call preventative measure, medicine. 8.22, reproductive choice and population limits. Reproductive choice is another domain given to individuals to control. 
Birth control is essential to reduce the numbers of humans. This is a medical and a political issue as well, and even some scientific academies of the world do not agree with it. In 1993, an international gathering of scientific academies called for zero population growth. However, the academies, academies from Africa disagreed, saying overpopulation is not a problem for Africa. Let us hope that in several generations' time, the children do not have to face the dire consequences for ignoring population growth. In addition to growth and population, other lifestyle factors are important. Fairness in the distribution of food and materials would decrease the needs of the poor, an economic and political issue. More efficient agriculture will also reduce the land that's required for agriculture, a scientific issue. Reducing consumption will aid this, an issue that is a public as individuals must change. A lasting earth is possible only if we all share proper concern and treat others as a family. Both social and technical approaches are required to solve the environmental crisis. We should reduce pollution by adaptive changes to our human society and system. Reducing consumption is something that the public as individuals can already change and must. Fairness in the distribution of food and materials would decrease the needs of the poor, an economic and political issue. We should work towards life philosophies emphasizing the shared earth that we live in. Over the medium term, the industrialized countries can shift uh, and switch to alternative energy sources and more efficient energy use combined with significant lifestyle change. Uh, this would be aided by the introduction, uh, for example, of personal environmental quotas to ensure that persons are conscious of the environmental costs of different products and behavior. The use of new technology will aid us in reaching a lasting earth. More efficient agriculture will reduce the land and energy that's required for agriculture and the pollution arising from agriculture, a scientific issue. Changing the way human beings behave towards each other is a supernatural task that can be aided by all of us changing our attitudes. We must ensure that sustainable living is encouraged, but recognize that it is only part of a broader solution. Sustainable living involves not just efficient agriculture, but also minimizing our energy use and pollution. It involves changing public policy. It involves changing the way people think, changing the way people act as well. In developing countries, the population growth rates must be decreased, and economic pressures that lead to the destruction of the environment must be eliminated. Um, human heritage on the planet Earth has seen different species of human, and we will evolve. This is a cover from the uh, uh, journal Nature, Strands of hair yield a 4,000-year-old DNA, uh, DNA sequence. Okay, so you can sequence uh, uh, hair from different persons. In the medium long term, the whole world can be using a large proportion of renewable energy sources, such as biomass or solar energy, combined with efficient agriculture using new varieties of crops. In the long term, uh, over 50 to 100 years, the world could be living in a stabilizing earth with a stabilizing population. Improvements in lifestyle can be made through the increase in energy efficiency brought about by technology and by the acceptance of more natural things that consume less energy, such as the pleasures of life. Let us hope that urbanization does not mean that people lose their enjoyment of being able to be in the presence of undisturbed nature under a blue sky. The broadest concept of a human family is the entire world, and the term human family has been used in the United Nations declarations. It has ancient roots, whether it be in the Christian concepts of the world or in that of Mao Tzu of China. Mao Tzu argued that practicing universal love was in one's long-term interest, not only because other human beings tend to respond in kind to benefits and harms received, but also because heaven wills those practicing the doctrine shall ultimately benefit. As a biologist, I see the development of a value of love of life quite consistently with a holistic view of life. Reductionists question why do people love others and love life. There have been various explanations on this. Richard Dawkins, uh, 1976, in the book The Selfish Gene, 
suggested that human beings are no longer shaped only by selfish genes, but by ideas called memes. Peter Singer, 1981, in The Expanding Circle, looks at a similar question. How the range of human compassion grew beyond the primitive bounds of a family to the idea of a disinterested interested defense of one's conduct. And in this thought of reasoning beings, it takes a logic of its own and leads to the extension beyond the bounds of a group. The recent concept of love of others in human beings has actually developed independently over the past millennia in religions of ancient urban civilizations, uh, China, India, Greece, Mesopotamia, Egypt, Mexico, and Peru. Uh, and they aim to stop excessive self-love by having a love of community. Uh, it's also interesting that often efforts to introduce love are made to combat excessive legalism found in cultures, so that cultures will go through cycles of legalism and then uh, situationalism, where you have a love dominating more than a law. And they go through cycles over time, the same as religious interpretations go through these cycles. Um, I'm sure as we study more cultures, we we'll find these types of patterns in other cultures as well. Okay, so that's the end of section 8.2. I'd like to ask if there are any uh, questions or comments. Uh, any questions? Anyone? And to see the, uh, the pictures, you need to use the, uh, the uh, iBook version, not the PDF version. Uh, so the iBook version is the uh, available if you have a, uh, an Apple or an iPad. Um, but if you have only the Windows, I'm afraid the PDF freezes only one picture. Uh, it's not interactive. But uh, you have to watch the video or c watch me in person. Um, any other comments, anyone? Any questions? Okay. Uh, if there's no questions, we'll proceed. To uh, you have a question? Hello. Go ahead. Yes, Hassan. Uh, yes, uh, I have a question uh, in part uh, eight. Uh, one, uh, 8.1. Uh, yes. uh, here, uh, you mention people make claims that science is ethically neutral. Uh, I think it, it's a very difficult issue. Uh, for example, in my experience, uh, some uh, religious people uh, used science uh, as a uh, as a, um, a, a comment of God, uh, or uh, they just uh, t uh, think, um, uh, for example, uh, looking for a cell on the microscope, uh, how uh, the God create the cell uh, exactly. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, I think uh, some religious issues uh, think that uh, science is something uh, that uh, to make uh, them uh, uh, them uh, experiment the God. Do you think is it it is ethically a neutralistic thing, or is it something that makes science a bit non-neutral? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Hassan. So, um, so what I've written, uh, this is also you know, related to when we have multiple religions and multiple ways of thinking, how can we have a universalism? And can we have universalism? Uh, should we have universalism? These are, these are important questions. Um, 
Now, one argument I could say is that I think uh, biophics is a love of life, and love of life is a universal concept across all cultures and all religions, uh, and it's both uh, biological, social, and spiritual heritage. So, uh, in that sense, we can find it. Now, as to the particularities of a particular faith or cult or whatever system we use, uh, even the uh, ph philosophers have their own philosopher they may follow. Biophysists have their own methodology they may follow. And different professionals have their own way of thinking. Whether I'm a lawyer, sociologist, anthropologist, or philosopher, or biologist, I'm going to think about problems slightly differently. And the same from a business perspective will be different to a, a non-profit perspective. Uh, but still we have some universals. And I think... Uh, when we're trying to look at behavior and a total uh, addition of all this behavior and what impact it makes on the world, for example, destruction of nature, we can find in every culture. Uh, selfishness about ourselves and those around us is found in every culture, regardless of religion. So these types of behavior we can find. Of course, there may be particularities. For example, I might be a cannibal and I might eat uh, people. Uh, I might be a Muslim and not eat pork. I might be a strict Hindu, a Brahmin, and not eat beef. I might be uh, somebody who only eats fish. I might be a strict Buddhist and not eat any, any animal protein. Uh, so these are particularities, but we can all have a love of life to achieve our life and a respect and love of others' lives. Uh, we also might view different ontologies of nature, what's our purpose ecologically. We talked uh, last week about anthropological, ecological, biocentric views. So that also is going to affect us. If I'm thinking of a problem from an ecocentric view, I'm going to come to a different conclusion. And later this chapter, we're going to see that uh, in the conclusion about uh, what sort of view and how that affects our, our way of thinking. Um, does anyone else have any, any questions or comments? Uh, Jill, uh, when we were reading through this uh, chapters, you know, it seems to me like this uh, enchanting you know, minds, like me, so it just, I was just spellbound with every articulation of the thoughts. It is so philosophically drawn and also science, philosophy, religion, everything was in linear end. And it is so interesting to read through this kind of, you know, logics in the world. Like, you know, when people are uh, more pursued with wisdom uh, and uh, rather knowledge driven, and if the person has got love to himself, if the person can love himself or herself uh, and his love to others, Okay, it can resolve a lot of the problems around the humanity. And in a world where we are, globalization is very much, the speed of globalization is so high. So, you know, just to resist the speed of the diversity of the globalization, maybe the humanity is one of the good solution. And this humanity, if it is deeper connotation of humanity, is love of oneself and love of others. You know, that really gives a lot of you know, direction to get us in a harmonious living earth itself. Because the earth is going to be a unlivable as if we push on the earth in this way. And as you mentioned about that, in future there is going to be, maybe in 50 to 100 years, there's going to be a more stable type of earth where the population and many of the things will be more stabilized. That is, a, of course, we dream for that kind of world. But at the moment, the globalization speed and the diversity and complexity of globalization, it seems to us that Earth is going to be very complex. So the humanity solution on the point, in the central concept of humanity, and the wisdom-driven world, and wisdom-person world with the love of oneself and the love of others can be the one big solution. Uh, I found you know, many of your quotation and many of the other quotation that you mentioned, this has been very much emphasized, and it is very interesting to read through. When we are reading, we are just you know, trying to understand the philosophy into it. And another social inequality issue, I didn't want to make a religious uh, 
the reference uh, i'm sure that most of the religion you know at the central point at the central concept it is uh, almost similar you know the all the good things are in religion the guidance so if i come to the buddhist uh, christian or muslim religion and of uh, so the uh, religious system has got lot more direction to reduce the social in uh, economic and social inequality just giving one of the example of the economic inequality movement where in certain of the verses of quran and also in our religious guide it has been clearly mentioned that you know when you have certain amount of wealth in in kind of you know maybe a some kg or pound of gold as well it is an economic value and also land and you have the cash money in your hand there is a restriction of amount that if it exists to that amount then for every kg of the gold and pound of the gold or a certain amount of land and certain amount of cash you have to give to the poor people distribute it so this is called zakat concept so you know if the rich people do like this way so then there will be no social inequality economic inequality it can be certainly gradually taken care of so you know sometimes like as many of the men's courts you mentioned about that how the science and religion uh, love to conflict but uh, they can really complement each other so and this is a more direction to humanity so i really found a lot of interesting points in this book i'm really enchanted with the points thank you very much okay thank you uh i say i've any other questions or comments from anyone uh before we move on to next check section 8.3 any questions or comments okay so uh we go on to um section 8.3 love as a decision guider Uh, while I conclude that love is universal, what are the other ideals of ethics that are universal? How do we balance conflicting ideals? And this, I think, refers to the question that you raised, Hassan, just before. Uh, love is a decision guider. 8.31, challenges of technology. How do we balance protecting one person's autonomy with the principle of justice, that is, protecting all persons' autonomy? Utilitarianism, the greatest good for the greatest number, is, as the founders argued, rooted in love. But even if we make the goal as serving love or happiness, it's very difficult to assign values to different people's interests and preferences. Different people's interests will conflict, so that there are exceptions to the maintenance of privacy and confidentiality. Many medical and environmental technologies are challenging because they involve technology with which both benefits and risks are associated and will always be associated. Sometimes love of technology replaces love of object, and the love of the object may replace the good, the goal of good, beauty, or happiness that Plato argued for. Human beings are challenged to make ethical decisions. They have to. The benefits of technology are great, uh, but there are many possible risks related to technology, the greatest of which is not to use it at all. The precise outcome of interventions in nature or medicine is not always certain. This uncertainty can be called a risk of failure or a chance of success. This is common to diverse activities such as taking uh, new medicine, driving a car, generating energy or production of materials. It has taken major ecological disasters to convince people in industry and agriculture of the risks. Introducing new organisms to the environment is also associated with risk. We may never be certain to have complete control over the effects of introducing new gene sequences. And with many cases, uh, much further experimentation is required before we'll be able to ethically allow full-scale use of them. We will never know exactly how one person will react to a drug or treatment, especially if it's novel. Ignorance of the consequences means caution in using new techniques, and this is an approach seen in the regulations governing the introduction of new organisms into the environment, the basis of quarantine regulations or the need for ethical review boards for human experimentation and clinical trials, respectively. The uncertainty is more important the greater the consequences of any disaster. If we introduce very novel chemicals or unusual gene combinations into the environment, they could have unexpected major consequences, which may be irreversible. 
but new genes may enter other organisms, or the new organisms themselves um, may replace existing organisms in the ecosystem. The ecological system is very complex. Minor alterations in one organism have effects throughout the ecosystem. We cannot yet predict these effects, so we must be careful and move cautiously. We have had bad experiences in the past to make us realize our limitations. There is only one Earth, and we are very dependent upon it. We must walk carefully. If a person has an extremely bad reaction to a substance, then life will be lost, breaking the principle of loving life. If a geoengineering intervention went wrong with the whole world, may be threatened. There are other emotions that are strong, but fear is one of them. India is a land of contrasts, and one where you can rarely see the power of fate. A small beggar girl comes with a face seeking money, help, or love. But for fate, the same girl can be smiling in the hand of her father on the beach on a holiday. One beach can be a clean golden sands without a person. Another beach may be a home for misplaced persons with their feces lying on the sand facing the waves. This is what fate asks of love. We can only overcome fate with the power of love. That is what people say saw when they said God is love. The answer has been given around the world at different times. There has to be a smile, a word, a glance to interact. Without this, the world is so cold and heartless. Uh, the response that we cannot love one bigger girl because ten will come is also based on our fear. Uh, our fear that we cannot cope. This does not mean that when we encounter children begging among cars, we sh could give money to them. The solution is that strength to love, a grace, a gift of grace that is beyond us to explain. Grace is a parallel to fate. One a positive, pleasant sound to our ears, the other a shattering one. Next time we come back to share a second with the bigger girl, we should be prepared, better prepared to handle it and to seek the strength that is needed. I hope she will be added to those I dedicate this book to. Love is infectious, but so is apathy. The answer to the question on uh, figure uh, 412, can love be sucked dry, is yes, if we do not open our heart. As I have returned from that experience, my flame burned a little hotter, and I hope it will not dim again. I wrote in my diary on that day, but I hope that I have a chance to share it, and I do. To help one in ten, a hundred, a billion needy persons in the world, we have to start somewhere, or else our fire will not die out completely. Love can be a decision guider, and it should overcome the fear that it will make us vulnerable or weak. Um, we need to critically assess whether love of life can be a theory of bioethics, even though it seems so obvious, um, obvious to me, and maybe obvious to you. Beecham Childress, uh, in Principles of Biomedical Ethics, listed eight conditions for construction of an ethical theory, though not all theories can satisfy them. The conditions given were, one, clarity. A theory should be as clear as possible as a whole and in the parts. Coherence. An ethical theory should be internally coherent with no contradictions and its inconsistencies. Three, completeness and comprehensiveness. If a moral theory includes all moral values, uh, it would be the most comprehensive, but at least it should cover as many moral dilemmas as possible. Four, simplicity. A theory should have no more norms than is necessary. Five, explanatory power. A theory should provide enough insight to help us understand moral life. Six, justificability uh, power. Through a theory should give grounds for a justified belief, not a reformulation of beliefs as we already possess. It should have a power to criticize defective beliefs, no matter how widely accepted those beliefs may be. So this justificatory power means I can justify a theory uh, based on the argumentation. Seven, output power. The theory should have uh, produced judgments that were not in the original database of particular and considered judgments on which the theory was built. Eight, practicality. Practicability. A moral theory should not be so demanding that it only a few persons can follow it. 
Can love provide us with one answer for each dilemma? Should that even be a goal of bioethics? The answer to both these questions may be yes or no. At an individual level, we are faced with a need for a decision, even as the decision is to avoid to face the problem and run. The balancing of principles, self-love, autonomy, love of others, justice, loving life, do no harm, and loving good, beneficence, can provide us with a vehicle to express our values according to the desire to love. But when we ask two people to do this balancing, the decision may differ. It's healthy for bioethics that we do uh, differ. At the level of a social system and policy, we also seek appropriate and consistent answers for bioethical questions. In many cases, love does provide a clear answer. Unfortunately, the answer and power of love may be unacceptable for the selfish state that we find ourselves in. But I do not think it is too demanding to be unpractical, at least as an ideal. When we reflect upon our conscience, we may know the answers are clear. All deserve a good chance. All deserve a chance to be able to love themselves and love others, like the beggar girl in my story before. We should uh, always not only respect life, but love it. In the Platonic spirit of Eros, seeking the best for our common heritage now and in the future. The principle-based approach to bioethics, based on love, is both a reconstructive theory that's interested in applications of moral principles, as well as a foundational theory that seeks to justify the use of principles in the foundation of love. Theories of bioethics like Beecham and Childress are basically reconstructive and leave a question of the fundamental foundations. They have an attraction because the same principles can work for people who look at consequences, actions, or motives, and provide powerful decisions that need to be taken in a world and culture that's split by apparently um, conflicting ethical principles. But they leave the fundamental questions inconclusively answered. I propose that love is a basis and foundation for human ethics and is central to the way that people make decisions. It is a universal basis of ethics and human behavior and should no longer be neglected in formal bioethical theory, nor in ethical cases. So do we need formal laws and standards? The idea of a slippery slope suggests that if we perform some action, we will automatically perform another. The expression envisages a slope where once footing is lost, it cannot be regained, and suggests that controls which are adequate for initial exploration may fail under increased pressure. While we may not be able to do any direct harm with an application in question, it could result in progressive lowering of standards towards the ill-defined uh, line beyond which it could be doing harm. The inability to draw a line is no measure of the unimportance of an issue. Rather, some of the biggest fundamental questions in bioethics and life are of this nature. And it applies to, much, uh, to more than just the near impossibility to satisfy desire. It applies to decisions in general, so that each new decision may go a little further along the road towards what was considered unethical. There is a danger that if love is unchecked, actions performed in the name of love will proceed along a slippery slope. In our life, we may try to draw lines and maintain them as a moral standards. If we get older, we may cross more lines. And often this makes the crossing of a line the second time more easily. Few of us learn from our mistakes, which is why the presence of some clear guides can aid us. However, rather than imposing laws that are correct 99% of the time and neglecting the 1% of times when the law is not ethically best, uh, we should give the law the flexibility that love demands. For in exceptions, a law may not be consistent with the moral law of the universe and thus may become unjust. Okay, so uh, 8.32, bioethical maturity. In order to have a sustainable future, we need to promote bioethical maturity. We could call this the bioethical maturity of society, the ability to balance the benefits and risks of applications of a biological and medical technology. It is also reflected in the extent to which the public views are incorporated into policy making while respecting the duties of society to ensure individuals' informed choice. Awareness of concerns and risks should be maintained and debated. 
for it may lessen the possibility of misuse of these technologies. Other important ideals of bioethics, such as autonomy and justice, need to be protected and included in the benefit-risk balancing that's important for the ethical application of biotechnology in the medicine. Concern about technology should be valued as discretion that is basic to increasing the biological maturity of a society rather than being feared as a barrier to the implementation of new technology. There have been many issues that have led to moral protest at different times, whether it be nuclear power or weapons, uh, irradiated or genetically modified foods, involvement in wars, use of animals in research, occupation by unjust governments, forestry, to name a few. A society which has promoted maturity could be expected to have moral protests and even support them as diversity. We would also expect activism against questions of conscience, though when this protest violates the respect for life, we would say that it's not mature. The motives for protest are not always based on the love of others. They may be excessive self-love in terms of protecting a group that we belong to. Uh, whether it be a disease-linked association, like muscular dystrophy association, or an activity-based association like the gun lovers groups that consider owning a gun as a human right. An important measure of the progress of society and cultural maturity is the degree of development of better ethical discretion in the personal and societal use of technology. The criteria of technolo technological progress is a measure of social progress is inadequate because technology may be misused or may be unavailable. We should not be soft-minded but rational. Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf wrote, by means of shrewd lies unremittingly rep repeated, it's possible to make people believe that heaven is hell and hell heaven. The greater the lie, the more readily it will be believed. Um, and I think he was quite effective in doing this, as have been many other people uh, who by repeatedly saying lies can make people believe a lie. A more mature individual will be able to have discretion beyond what they are told and beyond the efforts for manipulation of a mind by the selfish desires of others. Bioscience ethics demands responsible use of technology and responsible answers to important questions in life, such as a reproduction. People are very gullible, believing in the power of advertisements and propaganda. We can fear the overuse of genetic screening tests as they enter supermarkets and mail order catalogues. In the UK, cystic fibrosis screening can be ordered by mail order with a telephone call a week later to receive the results and counselling. HIV testing is also available in many countries. Yet while these tests have created many bioethical concerns, pregnancy tests can also convey news to persons which can change their lives and have many psychological consequences. There is no sharp line uh, between tests except the question whether a person is empowered by the information obtained is uh, some good uh, to some people. The pregnancy test can lead to ones to change one's lifestyle, stop smoking and drinking for example and seek medical help. Testing of diseases for which there is no prevention or cure or risk to others may only cause worry to the person being tested even if self-love suggests an autonomy of knowing about ourselves as much as we can. Love of life suggests we should not allow people to harm themselves, so we should not offer tests which have life or death consequences for people prepared for the results uh, without uh, counseling. Diagnostic tests when conducted carefully with prior thought are consistent with the informed choice of mature individuals. Prenatal testing also requires counseling so people can make decisions they're happy with uh, living with. Part of a bioethical maturity for a society is justice, to give everyone a fair chance. Methods to increase the ethical discretion and maturity of individuals and social systems should be developed. While we may agree with Pope John Paul II when he said, only a socially just country has a right to exist, bioethical maturity also allows tolerance of views of others to some degree and working to make all countries just. Another measure of a bioethically mature society is one in which the mobility between different groups is possible. 
Social classes are found in all societies, but mobility between these groups would be expected in the society if it's ethically uh, mature. This mobility increasingly depends upon education, in which case access should be made possible for all. Uh, we may also expect people in different classes to mix together in a more good, mature society, breaking down social barriers. We would also expect groups to tolerate each other and to have these conflicts, less conflicts, as a result of the mobility of individuals within the society between different groups. One of the uh, reflections on the genetic testing, uh, actually this video I'll be putting on YouTube, and if you look at the interesting adverts on that come with some of these chapters, uh, one of them was on uh, genetic fitness. It's a very big movement now. You should watch it and look at the links uh, it's, uh, when it comes up. Uh, basically, DNA testing to test your optimum fitness training and exercise. And you have uh, pictures of these very fit uh, men and women uh, who say they've done their DNA test and are doing the optimal training. We also have optimal eating, nutrigenomics, and uh, then of course many genetic tests. And some of the adverts are for testing your genome will come up when you look at through the uh, videos on bioethics and genetics that I made on the YouTube. Uh, it, so these are quite interesting uh, to show just how popular these movements are. And obviously the companies are making money on people's uh, anxieties and their hopes and aspirations. Is this ethical? Uh, I don't know, but it's uh, this uh, criteria that we should have uh, something positive that we can do as a result of the test uh, to make it useful is important. Section 833, a good life for all, you bias. These questions need international and cross-cultural answers for the world to live in. The questions need the perspectives of all and some groups are represented in this book. I certainly do not imply by the absence of a viewpoint or the inclusion of one that the views presented are the only solution. Rather, some papers illustrating approaches from different persons and traditions are included, and other diverse views are found in publications of Eubias Ethic Institute. The word Eubias means good life, and such a life must be sustainable. The comments from peoples in the different countries from the International Biophic Survey were a necessary part of a total picture needed to formulate any international measure of bioethical maturity and to develop approaches to improve maturity. We still need to learn more. How do we judge what is a morally correct decision? The use of love can be used to support legalism, situationalism, or antinomianism. Is love the only reliable principle, or are we the derivative principles also reliable? I may argue that love is the only absolute principle of ethics, but from that we can derive some prima facie principles and rules that can help us apply love. We do not need to examine every new situation completely afresh. Rather, we can use love as a moderator for conflicts between opposing principles of love. How do we judge what's the greatest good for the greatest number, the action that will produce the most love? As Plato wrote in the Symposium, love is a desire for good. The values that we will be regarded as good need to be defined. Looking among cultures, the value that seems premier is life itself and its preservation. Therefore, the conclusion that biophics is the love of life. The objects of that love can be persons or theories, but above all, life, living organisms. While a mature person is rational, they are also with a tender heart. As King in 1963 wrote, the hard-hearted person never truly loves. He engages in a crass utilitarianism which values other people mainly according to their usefulness to him. He never experiences the beauty of friendship because he is too cold to feel affection for another and is too self-centered to share another's joy and sorrow. He is an isolated island. No outpouring of love links him with the mainland of humanity. Perhaps a mature person has a hard head but a soft heart, but both traits must work together. We should not judge others as if we are all guilty of omissions of doing good and for doing harm. 
and not reaching the ideals of love. In a study of the moral sense, uh, James Q. Wilson wrote about sympathy. It's not easily aroused, but quickly forgotten. When remembered, but not acted upon, its failure to produce action is easily rationalized. We're often softened by the sight of one hungry child, but hardened by the sight of thousands of uh, hungry children. However, in society, there will be times when people should be judged for crimes. Love of life would argue against capital punishment being inconsistent with the respect for life. Responsibility of a person for their actions might be lessened when they are ignorant of the consequences of their action, as we already do for crimes by children and mentally sick at the time of a crime. Compulsion has also been used to excuse behavior in times such as war or mind control. Genetic or environmental determinism are also being used to explain criminal acts. Rather than separating emotion and reason, they are interdependent. Tillich argued that justice is taken into love if the acknowledgement of the other person is not detached, but involved. Our choices and intentions towards others should be governed by their aims and aspirations as well as our own. Love of others then provides a, basic, a basis for respect of them and relationship with others. There are various cultural standards imposed for relationships as discussed in this book. Words like thank you may be a symbol of love in their presence or in their absence. In China and Tanzania, for example, people may not say thank you or sorry if they are close to each other. The idea of thank you is a European import into their cultures and can be said to be unnecessary if people trust each other. Both these cultures, though, have a practice of gift giving. It's another way to express the idea of thankfulness. Okay, so these are etiquettes that we can see uh, are and expressions in our vocabulary. When one tries to think of a meaning of love, we can imagine many features of relationships, such as trust, security, and hope. The love that we receive from others keeps us alive and motivates us to new heights. Love can free us from the pressure that time imposes, as epitomized in the story Momo. Uh, the, if you know the story of a German writing Momo, it's about the uh, importance of time. Uh, and as some people have observed, the uh, pace of life in different countries is very different. Uh, so the way we value time. Not only is love the message of ancient religions, but it's also incorporated in, into a new age religious movements that blend a message of love into new hopes for the happiness of humankind. It's interesting that personal happiness continues to be included in the message of love, as it was in the message of Buddha, Christ, Mao Tzu, and Plato many years ago. Mahatma Gandhi wrote, I have nothing new to teach the world. Truth and nonviolence are as old as the hills. Colonization has been a major force to articulate uh, bioethical value systems that were previously implicit in the relationships of people and nature. Along with colonization came waves of Christian missionaries, and the Christian faith was readily adopted in a local form. Anthropologists also described a number of traditions, although some sacred knowledge is preserved among chiefs and only informed to those they decide to entrust such wisdom to. The preservation of sacred knowledge has not always been easy but it's an essential part of human diversity of thought. Uh, figure 8.5 is a painting by my mother, uh, Eileen Rose Mesa, uh, with a mystery of life that we follow our path through new valleys and hills. And uh, in fact, especially later in her life and after being diagnosed with ovarian cancer, a number of her paintings had a sort of roads leading into gardens or mountains or other things. She's trying to think about the future. Uh, what's beyond the hills? For the mother duck and the ducklings, the cycle of life and death must be fought with a new, new life. So we have a picture of a, a duck's about to swim. Uh, maybe which way should they swim? And uh, climbing the Fox Glacier in uh, New Zealand. There's a picture here in the book. Uh, it's actually my mother uh, as well in this picture, 1953. Uh, so climbing glaciers, uh, which way do people go? 
Uh, ducks are not unlike passengers in the boot boat to India, seeking the future while enjoying a love of life. Freedom and moral thinking that is a result of applying the principle of love is not without a price. The freedom given to us to love and choose to love can often lead to despair. As John Lennon wrote in Mind Games, uh, a song in 1973, love is a flower, you've got to let it grow. If we don't let it grow, uh, it will not uh, uh, exist. However, we are often stopped the growth of love by omission or guilt or conflicts. Education at all levels of society is called for in all countries by their national curriculum goals and by the uh, Millennium Development Goals of the United Nations, uh, which have now become sustainable development goals. Education of bioethics should lead to identification of values and better decisions which result in actions. A decision without action is unfulfilled. Education should lead to empowerment of our ability to love life. But if, if it is complete or misled, it can sometimes lead to hopelessness, a situation worse than before it started. And do we want to understand how we make decisions and why? Or we just want to follow social norms? Social norms offer security and reassurance for our failures, but the common morality may not be good enough for our, fu our future path. Is a person who fails to love morally deficient? The story of a good Samaritan is found in the New Testament of a Bible and describes how a stranger helped a victim of a robbery and beating. Both motives and actions were based on caring or love, as there was no religious law forcing the Samaritan to help the injured man. The person who fails to love is certainly not reaching an ideal, but how much effort is to reach our neighbor is necessary. As much as we can is not a frightening answer, it can enrich us. There will be a time when a stranger wants to leave, to be left to end their life. That peace comes from an expression of love that is often harder than trying to do something to keep him alive. A time to let love conquer the instinct of love of life. Does the presence of an ideal put some, someone off striving harder to help others? Do people just give up totally and become bad? Generally we do not though hope should be given when we are disappointed by our own failings to reach the common ideal. Love points us to face others which are not isolated individuals, but one family of life. At least we can conclude that we should all try a little harder to reach a common ideal, and then the world would be a better place. Uh, let us try. So that's the concluding chapter of Biofix's Love of Life. Um, so I hope you understood this uh, second to last paragraph. Uh, when people reach towards the end of their life, uh, a Taoist principle of flowing with nature, uh, you let people flow. Uh, enough is enough. There will be a time to let love uh, of others conquer the instinct of love of life to preserve life and keep alive. Some of you may remember earlier in this book I wrote about uh, an image of a dog I saw in Cairo that had had its back legs crushed by a car that was using its front legs to still struggle to get off the road. This is the love of life, a struggle to keep alive. But at a certain point, uh, our love uh, will be sufficient that we will try to, um, uh, to let flow with nature and uh, we have to decide that point. Okay, so I hope uh, we've covered a lot of material uh, and uh, you may have some comments on and discussion on this. And uh, thank you for the cover of Momo uh, Hassan. Uh, so do you have any comments, uh, questions, anybody? Anyone have any questions or comments? May I? Yes, you can may go ahead. Yep. 
Uh, it was a very interesting paper. Thank you for reading us. Uh, and uh, there are so many topics to uh, think about it. Uh, and I think now uh, love is the centrum of all our lives. Uh, and, but it is not enough. Uh, I think it's not enough to say I love uh, the animals. I love the beggar girl. I love uh, the uh, all the living or created. Uh, I think uh, it's more in the, um, to take responsibility is uh, is our um, uh, duty. I think uh, if we love, we, we must uh, make action uh, to uh, the thing we love. If we see a beggar girl and uh, we, we can't say only we love them or uh, we must uh, do something to uh, change the world to make a better world i think like you and thank you for this and i have a question uh, on page 177 uh, there was a sentence like the balancing of the principles self-love autonomy love of others justice and loving life do not harm and loving good for beneficence uh, is this, is that uh, do, do you have uh, use them synonymous? Um, I have uh, thought about it. Is autonomy self love? Uh, I can say I love myself, but uh, when I am in a prison, I I can't be autonomous. Mm. Uh, but this is a question for me. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zara. So, actually, the principal autonomy is self rule. It's not self-love. I use the term self-love, which I think is more important than, as a bioethical foundational principle, than uh, autonomy, which is self-rule. So uh, well pointed out. And there will be times where I can still love myself and have dignity of myself, even when I have no autonomy and no self-rule. And that self-rule may be taken away from me because I'm in prison, or in chains, or it may be taken away uh, by um, my accepting that I'm part of a community and uh, giving my opinion to, to other people to uh, sort of as a communitarian structure, I'll say, I'll go with what other people say in my team, uh, for example, a sports team. Uh, you wouldn't want all the members of the soccer team to be autonomous. You'd want them to all be playing together and then you'd succeed. Um, and some of the one people that have achieved the most uh, uh, reflection on self-love or justice, they have sometimes done so when they've, limit, they've actually been put in prison. Um, yeah, so that's a very uh, good point. Um, and these uh, principles uh, also relate, trying to relate the principles uh, in a simplistic sense, but uh, later earlier in the, in the book, I explain yeah, that, um, uh, that loving life uh, as do no harm, again, is somewhat restrictive because loving life is also positive, positive energy to enjoy life. Okay, that's also part of loving life. So uh, again, you can take these love principles a bit more broadly. Um, uh, I think. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Are there other comments or questions? Thank you very much for such an interesting and very thoughtful reading. You know, it is it has many dimension of thinking and it's really making us. I'm sure everyone is getting more deeper to our thoughts because of this kind of reading. Thank you very much. So you are adding maturity to our thoughts. Thank you. So the one thing is like, you know, when we, uh, as the, most of the last part of the write-up of this book, you try to overstress on the um, power of love. No? So the love is a central, uh, it can be the central power or the central governing things of the uh, biotics. So biotics is a love of life. So considering this, like when, we, oh, yes, when the terminology ethics comes, Either without uh, understanding, majority of us will go to add or visualize certain of the words, the words to this ethics like equality, fairness, justice, 
of course love as well and some regulatory behavior so this automatically comes in our mind in the in the word linked to the ethics but if i come to the deeper aspect of the love issue so the love is an it's an more emotion and it has more kind of you know it's not principle driven it's more kind of like you know emotion driven so, so how this love was the love is a rational love give us a lot of emotion loving ourselves loving to the others so it has got uh, feelings aspect more into it so giving this love to more kind of a, a equality fairness justice and all those kind of linked as ethical point of view how this part is linked to here like the in the love issue because uh, you know if this is uh, like the knowledge is we say that knowledge is a power so this word is a lot more strong strength in it that knowledge is power so if the love is the power of the bioethics so this word should be very well understood the uh, definition and the deeper dimension of this love very linked to many of the ethical concepts. so i when i you, you are reading to this and i was finding sometimes it's very logical okay love should be sometimes i found it's it's like love is too emotional so sometimes you know love if it's overflown of love sometimes it it even become a little irrational as well so where the rational boundary the ethical boundary into this so ethics and love putting this two word as knowledge is for knowledge is power type of so it still my idea is little kind of cloudy so can you just make it more clear to me from that ethical point of view yes yeah, so uh in fact if we look um uh in chapters 1 and 2 uh, of this book, it looks at defi you know definitions of love. Uh, why do I use an ambiguous term, love, uh, uh, to refer to in bioethics? And I think uh, partly on purpose because bioethics includes many wa many ways to view things. By identification of some principles within love, uh, we can try to make it a bit more. Uh, uh, easy to uh, educate and to understand and reflect on our values uh, and I think it can be useful for teaching us both the rationality of making decisions as well as the emotion and passion that is necessary to be a living living being um, so I think this is one of the issues uh, Laura by the way a love is a holistic and universal concept so all kind of loves are are connected. You can't love to other people if you if you don't love you yourself first. And it is uh, the the word love is connected with other other concepts like compassion, empathy, etc. And true love, of course. Well, again, uh, that even opens up more questions as to the definitions of. For me, I use love rather than compassion. Um, uh, empathy, sympathy, uh, being at one, uh, and what's true love? So I might say true love is uh, across species uh, and across genetic interest love, to me is true love. So the dolphin saving the dog, to me, is true love, because it's across uh, species. Um, and it uh, is, has no, almost no selfish interest. Um, yet, what is wrong with mother's love? Some people would say mother's love is true love. Yet, mother's love is clearly genetically programmed. Uh, but it's also uh, a special type of love. And so, we can say, uh, um, isn't that uh, true love, mother's love? But, uh, so, and that means, it comes back to the question of a free will, exercise of a free will. Do we need that for love, or can it be just beautiful the way it's programmed into us as well, as a behavioral choice? And why should we say free will is of a higher hierarchical value than, uh, than something which is programmed? Do you say that um, l um, mother's love is true love? I think sometimes this is not true, true love because sometimes mothers are egoist with their children. Yeah. Yes, and uh, 
and also, yeah, I mean, it's self selfishly, but uh, often people think of that from a genetic point of view as well. Uh, any uh, any other comments on a uh, true love? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. okay you go, on, oh, sorry. go ahead, Hassan. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I, uh, I will ask uh, uh, an old question uh, to all of you. Where do love gets bigger, in heart or brain? Um, I, I think you mentioned love in brain. Uh, am, Am I right? Uh, I think I mentioned love uh, in every part of the universe. Uh, but you can go ahead. It's a very important question. If you have a heart or a brain. But I'm also saying, I'm also saying the beginning of this book, I say love is in the use of the, the last piece of energy the bacteria uses to swim towards, um, uh, swim towards its food. So that's also love to me. Uh, so there's, okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I, I, I would like to mention uh, an old uh, question about love. I just want to uh, share this for friends all over the world. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so is it in the heart or the brain more? Is what you're saying? Um, uh, in my in my op opinion, in, in heart. Ah. Yes. It's Hassan's... No, uh, I don't agree. <laughs> okay, you have to uh, identify... It's totally controlled by brain. It's nothing to do with the heart. Everything is being controlled by the mind. I mean the brain. That's my opinion. It's a very good question, Hassan. Let's go on. Hearts or brains or feet? Is the name of here? Nothing, what do you think, Appa? I agree with you. I don't know what it is. Uh, the heart and the brain say the same thing about love. That love. There's a true love. The heart and brain is in the same line. You know, heart just pumps the blood, you know. So heart doesn't control anything. It's just pumping out the blood and, you know, the and uh, for purification, I mean, the... Co uh, containing the oxygen and deoxygenated, so it's just helping out. So I don't think love is there, you know. I don't know why people just go back to this whenever the love is there, just you know, they're just taken away and just touches the heart. I don't think so. It's everything controlled by the brain, you know. So, uh, I see. Name? I forgot. So, Sh can you help me out? Shahana, it sounds <laughs> like you're a surgeon, very mechanical yeah. view of the heart. <laughs> Jerry, what do you think? You, you being here, you know, be honest. Be honest. Really, where is that hard thing? It's in the brain. Don't you agree? Uh, I'd like everyone to have their expression. Uh, Margaret, yeah. Margaret, thank you very much. You've written the hypothalamus. So that's where the heart is. Is that the, your heart, Margaret, is the hypothalamus? Yes, hypothalamus. That is what I wanted to say. Yes, the hypothalamus. That's the con. That's the main place for her. I um, mean, showing of affection, love, and everything. Nothing to do with the heart. I don't know why people go for this heart. So let's vote. How many is heart and how many is brain? We have to have a discussion further. Other people. Any other comments? The mind possesses everything. The mind possesses possess everything. And where's the mind? The mind, the brain. Is in the brain? Yes. Okay, the allow. mind is in the brain. Other people? Hooray for the brain. Hooray for the brain. <laughs> Anybody else? Come on, for the heart. What about this? No, oh, you're, you're telling people to tell the heart? No, no, don't. Just make it vague, you know, let everybody answer. Okay, now, for example, uh, it seems in the conference, when I was there, many people seem to be governed by the stomach because they said that uh, I'm hungry, I want to have a coffee break, I want to have a food break, um, I want to have lunch. So isn't that the center of the, the soul, the, the stomach? 
or maybe it's in the pancreas that releases insulin and tells us how to balance our hormones. Yeah? Maybe, uh, yes. maybe it's there in, you? yeah, go ahead. Sorry, like whenever we are hungry, but we want to like want to have something that is also thinking is also being controlled by the brain. Then only we can like thinking of food also makes us hungry. So that's the first thing, you know, even hungry part, the steps of um, uh, like uh, what to say, how to say, like uh, how to take food, you know, that also the first thing is controlled by brain. So it's nothing to do with stomach or heart, you know. I'd like to ask a Nurton, she's a biochemist. Do you think ATP is the uh, is the essence of life, Nurton? Anybody, uh, other people who have a biochemical understanding may understand. Yes, adenosine triphosphate. That's what. That's the one you are asking. ATP. Yes. So is that where your heart is? Is it in the mitochondria? Okay. Any other comments, anyone? We have a lot of very, uh, some very active and passionate people, influenced largely by their hearts to make many comments. But uh, they're saying it's their brain. But uh, a lot of people are rather quiet. Uh, I'd like uh, other people who haven't spoken. Uh, I think uh, there is uh, two issues to be uh, made clear uh, firstly. One is what is love, what, what we understand we mention love, and two, uh, we, uh, I don't mention uh, heart as an organ or uh, as something uh, including too much uh, cells or uh, biologic material. As Margaret uh, says, uh, uh, love is uh, something that I think cannot uh, cannot um, uh, be clear uh, uh, in the physiologic uh, environment of the world. Uh, I, I, I think it, it is morally um, salting. Okay? Thank you very much. Okay, so you're thinking about the soul now. Okay. Okay, any other comments? Uh, may I have a comment? Yes, you may. Uh, it's uh, love is uh, about feeling. It's about sense. Um, uh, the centrum of the sense is in the brain. But if I love my cat or if I love my child, then I feel it on my heart. Uh, the love. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you very much to add on this point. I just want to go back again because you know everything is in brain because the nerve cell control everything. So if in that way we every whole body is governed by the even our. Uh, micro cell level but the question is when it is the question of love of course the brain has this um, you know the chemical which really you know create the energy of love but when it comes to the feel because love is the word which has got the mind soul feelings thinking everything together so it is the linear link of the brain and heart that is called love so when i feel something the impression goes from my brain but the whole body of my love expression, the heart, particularly the soul, the central part, feel it's very deeply. And then the rest of the part of the body act on that. So it is a very linear connection of the feelings from brain to heart. So if it is in the same line, that is called a true love. I see. So heart and, and brain. So there is a picture of the uh, cover of nature with the ancient human genome. So. The DNA, maybe this is the essence of uh, both the information to code the potential for the growth of the brain and the construction of the brain. Uh, from social relationships, we could say is the essence of love. So if I was not looking at an individual level, but rather I'm looking at a communitarian level, then love is not in one brain or one heart. Love is the social construction of an interrelated network 
of uh, expectations and autologies and histories of people. So uh, I think I would have that view uh, if, since you asked me what's my definition. It is actually the social construction uh, through our biological, social and spiritual heritage of all the individuals together in a relationship, in an ecosystem. Uh, and uh, just to uh, remember, we've talked about how many organisms are in your body that you call yourself. There are thousands of species in there. Your brain, there are more bacterial cells in your brain than human cells. Okay? These are part of the essence of, uh, of uh, living organisms. Every intercellular space, um, how do they get there? There is viral DNA, you know, 8 to 10% of our genome is viral. So is that the essence of love? So this symbiosis, uh, this uh, principle of relationships, therefore the mechanistic view, uh, which is sort of extending from a dualistic view of soul and body, that the center of our love is our brain, um, I think is also individualistic. We actually, for me, the love is a communitarian social construct. So an action only becomes love because of its relation to something else. On the other hand, the love of individual life, this passion to enjoy life and be able to enjoy life, is something we have inside, but it's inseparable from our relationships to others. So uh, that may be a way uh, to incorporate all these, uh, these views and uh, to point us back to the importance of our future uh, to make decisions. We make decisions mostly in relation to our lives in context of others and the organism. Okay, so we certainly hope for a eubias, a good life for everyone, a holistic sense. Uh, so I'm sure you may have some more comments. I'll put it back to you.